Recording is on progress. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Explorations in Atlas TI webinar series. This is a joint project between Atlas TI, the University of British Columbia International Qualitative Research Toolkit out of Kelowna, British Columbia in Canada, and the School of Education Inquiry Methodology at University or Indiana University. My name is Juliana Barabbas. I'm gonna be your moderator today. We're just doing a little bit of housekeeping before we start here at nine o'clock, which is coming up quickly. Uh, wanting to let everyone know that we'll be using the Q&A box to take all questions. And as soon as we uh, finish our introductions, uh, Julia and Ken, our presenters today, will speak for 40 to 45 minutes. Questions will come at the end. I'll read them on your behalf. And we do encourage you to ask any questions that you have in that Q&A and looking forward to your responses. So I'm gonna pass things over to Andrea now. Uh, who is our Atlas TI representative. Andrea, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, to the session uh, of the Qualitative Methods Masterclass uh, webinar series. My name is Andrea, and on behalf of uh, Neringa Kalpoka, director of uh, Atlas TI, I am very pleased to announce that uh, this series of uh, webinars is organized by University of uh, British Columbia and so sponsored by Atlas DI software um, uh, for qualitative data analysis. The International Qualitative Research Toolkit, IQRT, uh, offers two webinars, Exploration in Atlas DI and uh, Insights in Qualitative Research Methods. Uh, though this um, series, uh, in this series, we uh, highlight um, innovative approaches and practices in qualitative data in Atlas DI and in uh, qualitative uh, methods in general. We strongly believe uh, that sponsoring this project uh, can help others, uh, researchers um, around the world uh, with their research projects. Uh, before um, I gave the microphone uh, to the moderator of the session, I would like to just go through a few things about Atlas TI. Uh, if you're interested in learning the software, we offer free webinars on qualitative research, literature reviews, or Atlas TI in general. And also just because you um, are participating today in this uh, webinar, uh, you deserve a special uh, discount coupon for courses and licenses. Please, um, at the end of this uh, webinar, just drop us uh, an email and we will be uh, pleased to offer you the coupon discount. Um, this is uh, everything from me. I'm gonna pass the microphone to Juliana. Thank you and enjoy the, the webinar. Thank you so much, Andrea. And uh, thank you also for that ongoing support. IQRT, International Qualitative Research Toolkit, was conceived in conjunction uh, with the support of uh, IIQM's Thinking Qualitatively Conference, which Atlas also supported this last summer. Recordings are still available for that. On our first slide, you saw the, uh, the uh, web address for the IQRT as well. We have archives for both this explorations and our insight series that are available on that site as well. So if you have any other questions on that end of things, you know where to find us. So thank you again, Andrea. Our two presenters today, Julia Glusing is a business and organizational anthropologist. Ken Riopel is an engineer and together as professional researchers have helped industries from car manufacturing to IT, as well as spearheading a national or spearheading a national science foundation research project as professors, entrepreneurs, and business consultants. This husband and wife team have an impressive and innovative track record. They've been using Atlas TI in fact, had their eye on it when it was still DOS-based. <laughs> They've used every version since that point. Uh, they, have, uh, they have focused primarily on global teaming and product development. It is absolutely an honor to have them join us today for strategies for data analysis using networks to obtain meaningful results. I'd like to please have you welcome Ken and Julia, Julia Glusing and Ken Riopel. Over to you.
Okay, thanks very much. Um, we're really pleased um, to be here and to, um, to share what we have learned over the years about using Atlas TI, particularly um, using networks and how, how the network view has helped us obtain meaningful results from our own data. So you've already learned a little bit about who we are and our primary purpose today is to demonstrate um, two strategies for using Atlas TI Network View. Um, and we're using two real world projects to illustrate our um, techniques. And one of them is a theory driven kind of top down approach. And the other project illustrates more of a data driven bottom up approach. Uh, one thing that when Julie and I were picking these projects, uh, we thought, let's pick two classic projects that have stood the, the test of time. And so uh, these are our selections. They are um, older, but we felt as though these represented really techniques that people can use uh, um, ongoing and improve their worth um, over time. Mm -hmm. So um, the first project was a National Science Foundation um, subcontract um, to an award that was given to the Greenfield Coalition for New Manufacturing Education. And this, this particular um, report dates back to 2004. Um, and that's why we were able to, to share it with you. It's older and um, all, uh, uh, but still very, very relevant. And um, it is uh, something that um, is uh, um, now in the public domain. So um, that helped us also um, make that report available to you. Um, we examined um, something we called shareable learning resources. And this was at a time when flash technologies had um, just been um, introduced into the marketplace. And the idea was to create um, little um, tidbits that could be used in the classroom to illustrate um, almost in a, in a live simulation what goes on in a manufacturing floor um, and different uh, tools and, um, and um, processes that are used on the manufacturing floor. And we wanted to evaluate um, the use of these tools. The National Science Foundation had asked us to do that. And so we set about um, doing um, interviews with um, users and developers who were involved in the overall Greenfield study, which was quite large. It was um, a multi-million dollar project involving um, several universities as a coalition. And so we interviewed a lot of the people involved in the creation of the shareable learning resources and also in their use. And um, we observed uh, several of um, uh, the tools being um, actually used in education. And we also did some secondary data analysis drawing on um, many of the documents that were created as part of this um, project. And these were our five primary research questions. Um, we asked about um, the attributes of shareable learning resources and about perceptions um, that might affect the rate of their adoption. And we asked about how um, the shareable learning resources were communicated um, to people and about the nature of the social system, what the network patterns were and how those might impact the rate of adoption. And we were also um, concerned with, with understanding how the change agents and their efforts impacted the rate of adoption. And um, we used a socio-technical systems framework as well as um, general um, theory of, of diffusion of innovation from Everett Rogers that helped us certainly 
um, develop our research questions. And we, we really understood our, um, our research uh, topic as um, being a systems topic and uh, affected very much by um, the interdependencies of technology work process, the organizational structure and systems in which the technology was used, the people who were using it um, and who were also marketing it and what the communication patterns were, um, as well as the influence of the larger environment or context. So our coding strategies, we developed really an initial code book based upon that diffusion of innovation theory. Um, and uh, we used um, prefixes of F for factors. And we also used a prefix of M for the questions that we created in our interview protocol uh, to, um, to try to, to get at the factors that were part of diffusion theory. And we added new codes as well that um, emerged from the data in the coding process. And we put a prefix of D in front of all of those. And then we created also um, in the network view um, unassigned codes that we used as labels. And we used the prefix of N to um, indicate that those were nodes um, that were created in the network view and not necessarily um, related to any of the text that we were analyzing, um, directly related. So uh, that's a really nice thing about Atlas TI is that you can create these unassigned codes. They don't have to be attached to a quotation. So really what you're gonna have here is the kind of the behind the scenes of how did we create this National Science Foundation report and uh, which is not in the report. It just says, you know, here's the results, right? Um, but um, now we're gonna show you actually the Atlas, um, um, it, we would call back that the Herman Nunig unit, right? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go through and Julie's gonna show up the codes and so on that we had. Uh, the 24 documents or interviews and data right. that we had. And uh, from there, we'll give you a feel for how we went about after doing these interviews and observations to actually write the final report. So actually, you're going to get the final report, but in this webinar, you're actually going to see how we created the results. So you can see here that we had um, 25 um, or 24 interview documents. We have a lot of codes. Most um, uh, people will tell you probably that um, you should limit the, the number of codes that you have because they become unmanageable. But we use codes in a very different way in, and, um, and we do a lot of fine um, level um, in vivo coding. And then we use the um, Atlas TI network view to help us organize those codes in a meaningful way. And so what you are looking at here is, um, is uh, an example of a, um, of a network that we created um, in response to one of the, um, the questions that we asked about what factors um, lead to adoption. And you can see the M there, which, which um, means question, that was an actual um, question on the interview protocol. And um, we had questions about um, uh, administration, about the faculty, about um, uh, content, students, the technology itself, and then how it was marketed. And um, from that, we created um, uh, headings that um, reflected the data codes that um, we uh, created in coding this particular question. So each interview was coded um, by question, as well as by the various codes you see here with the D in front of them. And when we um, brought the 
the question code, the M09 um, factors leading to adoption code into the network view. And we asked Atlas TI to bring in um, all co-occurring codes. All of these codes then appeared in network view. All we had to do then was to organize them um, in uh, a way that made conceptual sense. And for us, this is what we, we ended up with um, for uh, the answer to this question, which then made it very easy to write up the report because we had everything we needed in front of us. And if we wanted detailed quotes, we could go back to the documents themselves just by clicking on the codes. So um, this is an example of one of the network views. And you can see here. Yeah, I was going to add to Julia. So that, mm -hmm. that was kind of a master uh, code because we had interviews with faculty, students, other, others. So we created M for me and a master one. And then the ends were all the our higher level unassigned codes as we looked at all these things. We just did this big sort and said, oh, this has to do with administration. These things have to do with faculty. So we sorted this kind of out and then finally said, all right, these are our big six factors that go with administration, faculty, content, students, technology, and marketing that it all had to do with factors that are leading to adoption or uh -huh. not. And um, a good example. So that's why we ended up with so many codes and so many actually in vivo codes as well. Uh, we have two more examples to give you an idea. Uh -huh. I think we uh -huh. have M10. Sure. Yeah. Barriers to adoption. Uh -huh. So here is um, here is another net network view um, barrier barriers to adoption. You can see again that when we brought in all the co-occurring codes um, with that uh, particular question, barriers to adoption, we were able to then organize them into um, categories that made conceptual sense. And then we put, the, we put the N labels on them, the faculty barriers, content barriers, technology, student and university barriers. Um, and again, it was very easy to, to, um, to understand uh, the responses across all the interviews and then to, to write them up in a meaningful way. So, you know, certainly fac faculty barriers had to do with faculty being aware of the, of the shareable learning resources and they had to, they had to shift their paradigm of teaching a little bit and um, that, so that was a, a, an issue and the fact that it took more time to use these um, tools in the, um, in the uh, classroom and then um, simply the, the generation, how old the, fac the faculty member was and affected their receptiveness to using tools like these shareable learning resources in the in the classroom and whether or not they got any training, whether or not they were rewarded for um, what they did, et cetera. So you can, you get the idea that um, it was um, uh, pretty easy to make sense of the data this way when, um, when we used fine level coding and then um, brought those codes in uh, to a network view. One more example from this project. This, um, this was a particular question about um, what was um, needed to create wider use of these shareable learning resources. So again, the same thing. It made it um, very easy to understand um, factors related to community outreach to, and to the, to the technology characteristics um, uh, themselves, um, what had to happen at the university level, um, what had to happen in, in terms of awareness and in terms of getting faculty prepared to use these materials. So it was, again, um, uh, 
an easy way um, to make sense of the data, especially for report writing. I think now uh, Julie's gonna go back and um, so we'll shift to our second example. So we'll have plenty of time to answer people's questions and go back here is uh, taking the opposite way from, uh, a, from the diffusion of innovations theory of social technical theory, where we really had kind of a code book ready to start with. We had those characteristics of innovation, media, uh, change agent um, that we're ready to look at in the data to a completely different uh, project. Uh, this was a proprietary um, custom um, industry consulting project that Julie and I did in the auto industry. It was about creating a knowledge base for our product development teams. So I'll let Julia talk, but this is really the opposite of just bottom up. We just had a few general interview questions that we started with and I'll let her explain what we've done there to show the opposite of, well, on, uh, just more of a data-driven grounded up theory point of view. Mm -hmm. So um, as Ken said, this was a consulting project and we were trying to develop a knowledge base. Um, in this particular company, there were executive coaches who were assigned to all the product development teams to help them with, um, with the people interactions that went along with their engineering. And these coaches, um, all thought that their particular um, product development teams were very unique and that they wouldn't have um, uh, very much opportunity to learn from one another. But their manager had a different idea and she um, had seen enough to understand that there indeed were patterns across all the product development teams. And so she, she asked us to um, go out and collect all the stories um, about the issues these coaches encountered in working with their product development teams and how the coaches helped the teams resolve those issues. And so we went out and conducted um, semi-structured interviews with the executive coaches. They were, they were very um, conversational and we had all of those interviews transcribed and we um, analyzed those interviews to create um, a hyperlinked knowledge base of all the issues uh, describing the conditions um, that existed in each of the cases um, and um, what strategies or actions were taken by the executive coaches to help the teams resolve the issues and that what consequences resulted from those actions and strategies. And, um, and then this whole knowledge base was then distributed or made available to all the coaches as an electronic knowledge base um, in a shared drive inside the company. So um, they benefited from it um, um, greatly until uh, a big economic downturn in the auto industry when the whole coaching um, uh, staff was let go, unfortunately, but, um, but the project was um, was a great one, and we still use these very same techniques today. Our coding strategies, um, based on Strauss and Corbin's grounded theory approach, we uh, let the, the codes really emerge from the data, and then we group them according to the following categories, the conditions and context, strategies, actions, and consequences. And then we also group codes to reflect the local context. We group them by um, what particular phase in the bro uh, product development cycle um, the issues occurred and um, the overall context. And we also group them by the kinds of people who were involved in, um, in um, the issue and then in resolving that issue. And we also uh, took a look at team processes and tried to group codes according to um, 
how they related to the overall teaming that was going on. We, we used a lot of in vivo codes and we tried to keep the results really grounded in the organizational language. Yeah, just to add, these were uh, roughly 90 minute to uh, two hours uh, interviews that were tape recorded. So they were quite long and extensive. Uh, just to give you an idea of product development cycle, this is something maybe over two to four years um, that a new vehicle goes through or a truck. And so it might start off with kickoff. Hey, you have a letter that says, here's our idea for a, a new vehicle. And then you kind of all the way go for several years as you go through the engineering cycle, finally until you get to launch and say, okay, it's in the plant, we're actually building the vehicle. So they're very, what they call stage gate pieces that we could um, bundle or segment or group um, the um, interviews around and actually provide that as a final report. So that was kind of background. And then we'll kind of show you the Atlas piece here. Again, kind of behind the scenes of mm -hmm. what, how we actually took those interviews and converted it to a, this knowledge base. So I'll close this project and open up the other one. Okay. So you can see there were, go on the right, you might say the um, yeah, there was, there were 17 documents and we put them into um, three document groups. Um, there's the 17 documents, the document groups. Um, we had um, people who worked on um, uh, pre-launch activity and, um, and launch and pre-launch. So we, we, their combo, and then each, each of those two um, uh, sort of high level um, organizing uh, labels for um, where the particular uh, coaches were working at the time. We had um, 518 codes in this case, lots of them, and we put them into code groups. The code groups um, were, Again, related to the context and the milestones in the product development um, process, as I said, and uh, people and team processes. And um, we had 63 different networks that we created out of this. And I'm going to show you a couple of them. So again, this is a, the whole idea that you're using in vivo codes, ultimately you're gonna come up with something very detailed that can be um, very practically used with a fine grain of um, articulation. Mm -hmm. So again, as always about here's the context, mm -hmm. where are you in that product development cycle? Uh, what was the uh, issue or strategy or problem that you were encountering? What did you use to try to resolve that? And what was the consequence was the actual end result? So here's a good example here. Right, and this is much more um, um, oriented to grounded theory. You can, uh, it's, not, it's not organized in categories as um, the codes were in the previous project. It's more, um, according to grounded theory, if we had one of the issues was that there, there was a lot of chaos around what the program was really about very early on in the product development process. There was constant change and that created um, chaos around the program. And associated with that was the chief program engineer, assuming that, that he really, or she, he, mostly he in this case, didn't need to, um, to really communicate. And that led to people um, just trying to make sense of their environment and creating their own chaos because they didn't, um, they just didn't know. They didn't know what direction um, the program was going. And so these are um, really in vivo um, um, codes that we created. Um, not hearing anything in your mind feels like we know stuff is changing, you know, just tell us. Um, and uh, given their experience on the program teams, they knew how much direction changed at any given minute. So there was a lot of, of, of chaos and changing, um, changing direction. So the Pro, uh, product development executive coach put together a strategy, put together a whole communication strategy. And these are all components of that 
communication strategy, a letter to the team, um, a feedback loop on the web, um, a team room where people could go in and take a look at the product and the, and the latest um, and greatest news um, about where they were in addressing um, product development issues. Uh, creating a, a leadership team and um, had an every other week meeting, uh, one-on-ones that the, the chief program engineer started having with key people in the program. They um, created um, uh, meetings for the different sub teams and um, some norms around communication, which didn't exist before. And they had all hands meetings when they brought everyone together. And then they also did some social activities, fun things like picnics. And all of those um, resulted in a, consent, a, a consequence of um, greatly reduced uncertainty. So this is how we created the, um, the knowledge base, was, was building um, a number of um, network diagrams like this that helped us then um, write up uh, what we were hearing in so, the stories. So in essence, these 63 um, network maps were kind of re-stacked re by the product development process. So where they fit in that kind of uh, kickoff to launch. And then the ultimately the uh, coaches could say, oh, yeah, I'm in this part of the process now. I just got a sign. Here's where I'm joining the team. And they had a pretty good idea what the experience other coaches had did, what they tried, what was the consequence. So Joy has a few more. But in essence, uh, having just a few interviews and having all those uh, codes made it very, very easy to articulate and gave us a lot of credibility when we were actually presenting the results and they could actually use it. Here's another um, a good example. Yeah, of and you, you could probably guess what company this oh. is, <laughs> but um, that's okay because it's it's um, it's it's old enough that it's outside the um, the any kind of non-disclosure agreements that were signed. None of this exists anymore, so um, it's it's fine for us to show it to you. But um, they were work. This particular team was working on a global program, and um, bringing in Volvo and Mazda created a lot of complexity on that program, and um, and that led to cross cultural barriers. And associated with that was the need to learn um, each other's way of, of how they built a car. And um, so what they did was created a number of different, the coach helped to create a number of different strategies, um, creating a section in the newsletter about cultural differences, um, CCI coming in and observing patterns and um, actually doing some training uh, and, and arranging social times for people to get together and um, learn about each other on an informal basis. They had a team picnic, um, coffee or dinner together. And uh, they did um, uh, a lot of things. Um, these, are, these are some of the major things in this team um, to, to help clarify uh, um, uh, understandings and um, avoid potential misunderstandings, clarify cultural differences and similarities and avoid misunderstandings. So this was um, another um, example of one of the issues that was encountered in the teams. Let's see another one here. Um, here's another chaos around the program. Um, again, this is not unusual in early on in the develop product development cycle. Um, there was, in this case, though, lack of alignment on the leadership team. And um, the, the chief program engineer and the functional managers had differing priorities that needed to be um, straightened out. And, um, and uh, a condition in, uh, that, that um, uh, we called an intervening um, condition in this whole thing was uh, um, delayed milestones. And um, 
So the number again of different strategies, um, holding meetings to do priority setting and action planning, providing individual feedback uh, and um, uh, consequences of that, um, making a public commitment to work on their alignments, um, creating a level of ownership um, that they needed to do um, something more uh, and making um, a visible toolkit, a uh, more visible toolkit on what they were actually being measured on and uh, could, to get clear on what was happening in the program, they made a matrix. Uh, all of these things um, were consequences. Um, some people did their own work just based on the feedback they got the one-on-one -on -one feedback mm -hmm. and the feedback in and of itself leads people to do things differently. So let me just do one more here. And, and then I think we can have a plenty of time for the last 20 minutes for questions from mm -hmm. someone that you have just to get, give an idea of uh, what we saw that mm -hmm. you could have a lot of codes you could have for this detail in this case for mm -hmm. both cases and use the in vivo and the network view to actually kind of organize um, a coherent um, write-up of the report. Mm -hmm. And so um, just by using the, the network view and bringing in um, co-occurring codes and neighbors and when the codes are, are, um, are quite long in vivo codes you really can get um, a good idea of, of what's going on. And uh, in this particular view, we're looking at the organizational factors that um, were blocking the team from achieving potential. And um, many of those were hierarchy and autocratic nature of, of the company um, and some objectives that may not have been set um, is, is, is something feasible to obtain. They were incompatible and infeasible and people didn't feel empowered to say no. Uh, and they, had, uh, they felt they didn't have the ability to speak openly and honestly with issues that existed. So these kinds of, um, these kinds of, of um, conditions then, um, uh, led the coaches to create um, team days and uh, that brought in um, people from, um, from Mazda and uh, who actually did do a lot of talking about Japanese culture and um, how they were uh, helping to um, create something new in the team. And these team days created a much more comfortable environment for people to speak out and uh, for working on um, the team uh, functioning. And um, they actually had um, marketing come up with um, uh, something to um, get the team to focus on the importance of um, the customer and uh, showing um, uh, customers the clay, showing the team the clay, that's the dis actual design of, of um, the car before it ever um, gets built. So lots of things that, um, that were done um, in this team and facilitated by the coach to help overcome um, the organizational factors mm -hmm. they felt were getting in the way. So while we stop here there, and I think we just had a few uh, final things and answer your questions and go back to any of this. Again, uh, the um, NSF report is available for you to see. That's public. Uh, we cannot share, even though our non-disclosure of the proprietary report, but yeah, I think you get a feeling for how we went about uh, doing the interviews, mm -hmm. writing up, coding it in the Atlas. And uh, in our case, we had the benefit of having these tape recorded. So we had some really um, good, um, uh, interview notes here. Yeah, and good, good, rich stories, and uh, a lot of codes that could provide um, a descriptive detail that um, we managed using network views and the pictures of the conditions, the strategies, and actions, and the consequences related to the different contexts. Um, really helped us understand how um, the issues were impacting work 
and, um, and what could be done about those issues and how to share those um, across uh, the coaching network. And we were able to write up the results that were grounded with a lot of credibility so that the people that were using the knowledge base um, could really um, um, understand it and identify with it. And they were valuable communication and sense-making tools. The network maps themselves were that. Actually, the network maps were included in the report along with the description. Sure, every one of those pieces they had that and actually the coaches use that as a further tool to say okay what else could be going on or it's another mm -hmm. strategy to use what about this so they were actually um brainstorming tools afterwards mm -hmm. used by mm -hmm. the coaches yeah they were in a sense um boundary objects that help them communicate mm -hmm. in the teams so okay that's i think uh, juliani uh questions other things that we can um, answer for the audience Thank you both so much for that. I am uh, I'm sure that we will have some questions. I have not seen any questions pop up in our Q&A as of yet. <laughs> so, uh, if, if anyone would like to just pop their question into, there should be a, a, a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please do fire away any questions. In the meantime, uh, I will ask a question. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. uh, so I'm getting the impression from the way that you talked about your projects that it was primarily the two of you that were driving coding all of that. How would you say um, the methodologies, the, the, the strategies that you used with these networks and coding would work across bigger teams? Do you think it's, do you think it well, would be? Well, we actually no. did work with a bigger yeah. team. It right. wasn't, it wasn't only um, the two of us. We had, um, uh, graduate assistants um, working with us um, in the case of the NSF project, and um, and we had um, uh, another person also working with us on the coding. So we were all doing um, team coding, and I've done projects like this where I've had you know like six people all doing um, uh, coding on a on a particular um, set of interviews. In one instance, I. Um, we had a whole team working in um, three different manufacturing plants and everyone was was doing interviews and gathering data and then um, doing their their own uh, coding of their of their particular data sets, but we had to merge them all and we had to agree on what the coding strategy was. We had regular meetings, um, we had a master document and I was in charge of that. But, but we had um, um, everybody working on their own um, coding. And we did a lot of, of um, coding together initially to make sure that we were quote unquote all on the same page um, in, our, in our coding strategy and our understanding of what we had to do. So um, it, it, it works quite well um, with, um, with teams, the same strategy. Um, just to add to that, oh, we had another National Science Foundation project with um, other colleagues in Texas and the graduate student was in Oklahoma. We were in California uh, at the time. And um, there we used Amazon Web Services. And actually we just put the Amazon uh, database on Amazon Web Services. And the we Atlas all, database. Yeah, the Atlas database on mm -hmm. Amazon Web Services, sorry. And uh, we used that. So we actually had a single license that people use. So we got around the idea of merging, all right? Uh, the only thing we had to do, be careful, we only could have one person on that um, service at a time. Uh, but they worked out, we'll text each other, hey, is anybody on? So you didn't get kicked off. <laughs> so that was a second way of teamwork. And mm, it was small, yeah. you know, you're only looking at about six people. Um, but that was small enough for six of us to use a single laptop, uh, basically a PC in the cloud to do our coding. And, and that was pre Atlas TI cloud. 
Right. right. Yeah, it was pretty hard. So right. now, now, now there's Atlas TI Cloud. So right. yes, yeah. yes. And actually, our previous explorations uh, presenters uh, back in September 28th did talk about cloud versus um, uh, uh, more dedicated Atlas. So interesting. For those of you who have interest in that, you can look at our archive. Uh, we do have a number of comments and questions that have popped up in the Q&A. So I'm just going to start these from Carlene. Uh, she says, or they say, thank you for an incredible presentation. You made the processes I've experienced as happening quite innate and so visible and tangible. So a thank you. What advice, however, do you have for starting out with a network? I sometimes experience being stumped with, where do I start? And then she's got a couple of other questions after that. But if you'd like to start with that. Um, well, in the case of our first project we presented, our starting point was was a question. For example, we had, a, you know, the question about related to the barriers that people um, were encountering in using um, the shareable learning resources. And so um, every, every response to every one of the questions in our interview protocol was coded with a question number. So, you know, it was very easy for us to bring that question number as the initial starting point into the network view and then bring in the co-occurring codes. And um, so that made it very, very easy. But that was different in the second project because we didn't have that kind of coding of the responses by question. We, um, we took a look at what were, um, what seemed to be patterns that we were hearing, what were really frequently used codes like chaos around the program definition or at the launch was something that people mentioned a lot. And so we said, okay, this is, a, this is something important. Let's bring that code in and see what co-occurs with it. And so for, for us, having doing co-occurrence um, or coding that way, because you have to code that way. Some people think that, that, that they can't double code a segment of text, mm -hmm. but, um, but but for us, that's one of the most valuable aspects of Atlas TI is that you can see many different things going on in a single response and take um, and, and code um, that single response, different segments of text in that response with a, um, a, a different code that really reflects what somebody is saying. And then, then you can, um, uh, maybe say, well, this whole thing has to do with chaos and chaos around the program definition, but these are different aspects of that chaos that get coded independently. So you bring in chaos around the definition and then the co-occurring codes and there you go. So it's, it's, you have to pay attention to your data um, and to the to the primary themes, the primary things that are that are coming up in the data, and that that should be reflected in the groundedness of your codes, and um, and then you know those codes that are really grounded, uh, they probably have something to say, <laughs> and uh, and they can be complicated. So you can you can bring those. That, that to me, I find that's that's a great starting. Um, point. Another one, just to add to Julia back, uh, uh, we've had other people do interviews and they have questions says, oh, you know, the interviewer uh, skipped and went back to another, went back to an earlier question, right? So he said, if you have a transcript or something like that, it's okay, just recode that kind of response back to that same question. So mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. uh, those question numbers, and it doesn't matter that they're exactly in order, they can jump around. We also found it's okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, this, yeah. this response really relates to question one, not to question five. We happen to be, we happen to be, we have asked question five, but the respondent is actually replying to question one. <laughs> and so, you know, you coded question yeah, one. Right. So it's, uh, it's and, and in that way, you don't have to be rigid in your, in your protocols. You can, you can make the interviews conversational. You can um, allow for um, um, serendipitous um, 
uh, interesting points to arise and, um, and still um, code in a systematic way um, that helps you build the networks. But, you know. We hope that answers that question. question. There's more underneath that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, responses are popping up in Q&A as, okay. as you've been speaking. And uh, our, our, our person who asked the question did just confirm, yes, you have answered all my questions, but okay. I will <laughs> relay some comments. Okay. She had asked, in addition, working deductively, as with example one, it seems that the network strongly correlated with the research questions, which you confirmed. Yes. How did you go about example two to build and enlighten the understandings created by the networks, which you've explained. So thank you. Um, she's also noting great explanations of teamwork and how to navigate the system abilities and a brilliant explanation of starting building and coding what it is you want to explore using multiple codes per quote to unpack the meaning. I'm hearing lots of uh, potential for capturing nuance. <laughs> it's yes, yes. That's, exactly, that's right. exactly right. Because if you code, you have 30 or codes or 50 codes and they're just super high level, it's like you have to go back and read every single quotation to figure out what what is really going on. And, and, and you can do that if you have a small data set. But if you have a big data set, and we've had some really big ones, um, we have found that it is just super valuable to code at, at a micro level and to code in vivo. And, um, and it doesn't matter that you have a whole lot of codes as long as you can, um, you, you can group them and as long as you can, um, uh, uh, relate them to some higher order factor, right? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So I'm just going to give people another moment here if there are any other further questions. Haven't up. Oh, so on coding and in vivo, it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I think she's in process with this question okay. for a second here. I'll give them a second. I, sh I have to stop my assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Carlene, did you have a question in relating to coding in in vivo? We may be looking at a bit of lag here in responses. Yes. How do you keep track of volume? I know you're speaking to grouping codes, but there can be so many. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I can go back to my Atlas TI and and um, and share. So second. as and as an example, um, they also asked, do you use prefixes that go beyond the one letter examples? Um, yes. Uh, let's we'll let's take a codes. look at the codes here. Um, so they're obviously alphabetical, but um, I also use well, like so you say CPE. We had a number CPE, of different things related to topic. yeah, FPDS. Um, mm, LR. It seems like with this much data, you're almost creating your own language structure around your codes. <laughs> you, you, you are, you are. Well, and, um, uh, but I also had let maybe the other project will show it better. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I think it, we have used different ones, um, especially we've done some with um, networks where we had um, um, and actually a doctoral student that was looking at um, mm. African-American migration from the South to the North in uh, Michigan and Saginaw. And he had um, a number of codes that, different de that depicted where they originated from, where they ended up, but also in the network uh, diagram, he actually then mm. said, this person relates to this person, they're part of this group. So he had a lot of prefixes that went along with their sociability, their work, that they work at this particular plant, were they a member of this church? So um, depending on the project that we've used. But in the, the larger case, that one, uh, the very we first one, we used M for on. master question. 
And then for the data and yeah, also things like this um, problem solving, problem um, cheating. So all the problem codes, all the skill codes, all the quality codes um, go together. And I think that speaks to the next comment that they made, right. which was since the codes are alphabetical, they find too many in vivo codes can require a lot of housekeeping to track. They use the search function to use particular words or phrases that cut across the alphabetical issues of codes being separated by many codes in between. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Agreement across the board. Yeah. 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 And we also, you know, often use, use the search that. function that frequency to actually say, well, what is being said across everything, right? And to use the right now search and search and code, right? It used to be right. the auto coding function. Yeah. And uh, say, all right. And often, often we will begin the project by doing a, um, I'll stop share. Yeah, here we are. Okay, yeah. I'll, I will um, begin a project by um, just doing, you know, the word list, Atlas TI's frequency list of all the of all the words in the in the documents and finding those that are um, that are uh, seem to be key and um, and then using those as um, and as kind of categories to begin my coding. I will do that. Mm -hmm. The, yeah. It sounds like a great visual <laughs> tool to add to the whole process and structure. So we're getting close to time. While people are thinking about any other questions, I'm also going to share my screen and just uh, thank you both so very much. Uh, and I'll take a moment to also, and yes, thank you for such insights and practical explanations, uh, which is, that's what Explorations is all about, getting into the practicalities of these uh, tools. We're all for pragmatism. Yeah, right. Does, <laughs> yeah, it work? Absolutely. Does it work? <laughs> Grounded in real world, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen here for a second just to uh, highlight that we do have some other pro, um, presentations that are upcoming in these series, and I'll keep an eye, whoops, I got ahead of myself. Yeah. Uh, upcoming in October, we have Insights and Qualitative Methodologies, our, our, our partner series to this series, October 26th, we've got Dr. Joe Norris talking about dramatizing the data for dialogic dissemination, a little bit of alliteration in this one. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Norris is a professor emeritus from Brock University who's been working with a, a method, a qualitative method uh, for theatrical exploration called play building. Very engaging speaker and I highly encourage anyone who has interested in interest in uh, performance and, and visual methodologies to check that one out. Uh, we also have another explorations uh, webinar coming up that not dissimilar to, to this one, uh, coding large amounts of data, text data, uh, Dr. Gerben Mormon out of the University of Amsterdam, but he's gonna be talking more about automation and collaboration and using those in conjunction with each other. So we've got a, a title to come from for November 25th for Dr. Mormon. We've also got a couple of other researchers that are uh, coming up that I'm gonna mention uh, without titles, but it's still of note. Uh, November 10th in qualitative or um, insights in qualitative methodologies, uh, Vivek Valanki and Tran Templeton from uh, Indiana University are going to be uh, talking about visual methodologies. Dr. Selena Richter, who's the new Dean of Nursing at the University of Saskatchewan, and her collaborator, Dr. Kimberly Jarvis, are going to be talking about qualitative research in international settings, November 17th. And on November 30th, uh, we'll be doing a webinar out of California, Dr. Robert Kozinets talking about metnography. So a few things to highlight. I'm just to, and oh, and we do have, of course, another question that's come up. Anyone who's wanting to register for these uh, upcoming webinars, you'll find information at our website as listed below. Again, a thank you. Uh, we are also, and I'll just stop sharing there for a moment. We do have a couple of 
more comments. Are we able to get access to the previous? Uh, yes, expiration presentations are in our archive. Please do check out, if you go to our main IQRT site, you'll see that there is an archive section uh, that you can click into. When, when you go to that page, both the, uh, um, uh, the insights and explorations archives are both available. And good to hear that one of you has worked with uh, Dr. Richter as well. So again, my thanks to Atlas TI and thank you for putting your contact information up. This is yeah, the yeah, favorite yeah. ways for us to cap. If, yeah, if there are questions, to yes, huh? sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Wonderful. Again, thank you so much for your insights and, and practical pragmatic um, breakdown of this these huge projects. It's, it's a great insight into how to grapple with these issues. I want to thank Atlas TI again. I'm not sure if we're going to have, uh, and there we are. Oh, there she thank you. <laughs> Andrea, Andrea, and Andrea from Atlas TI. And again, for those of you that attended, uh, don't forget about your code that you can use, uh, the, the discount code that you can use for attending today. And I thank you again, uh, Ken and Julia for joining us and hope that we uh, cross paths again soon. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Check out our archives Thank and we'll you. hopefully see some okay. folks on October 26th as well. Okay. okay. Thanks right. very Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.